Unleash the power of knowledge and connect with the heartbeat of the African diaspora. Download our African Diaspora News Channel app now on Google Play and Apple App Store. Stay informed with authentic and diverse perspectives, breaking news and cultural insights. Immerse yourself in a community that celebrates unity, resilience and progress. Experience the vibrancy of the diaspora at your fingertips. Don't miss out. Empower your perspective today. Search African Diaspora News Channel and join the conversation. 800,000 residents register to try to make Western Cape its own country. Hello everyone, my name is Naledi Mfulo and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the latest edition of the African Diaspora News Channel where we unravel the stories that shape our world and our communities. Today we dive deep into the currents of information from the pulse of politics to the heartbeat of entertainment. We've got it all covered. So please stay tuned for a news experience like no other. Some say it's about governance and economics, others cry foul, alleging deeper, darker motives. The crux of the matter, accusations fly that the push for independence is not rooted in economic self-sufficiency or political autonomy, but rather in racism. Say South Africa's future is far more important than South Africa's history, um, but, but I think it's a fair and a valid question, and the answer is that South Africa is now 113 years old, and for all of those 113 years, somebody has been in the centre of, of South Africa, dominating other people to their detriment. Initially, it was the, the, the British through, through colonialism, then it was the, the, the National Party um, through, uh, through apartheid, and now we've got the, the ANC, and the answer clearly is that one central government, with all of the power in Pretoria is always a disaster for someone and at the moment it's a disaster for everyone other than a very very uh, small uh, politically collected ANC clique. Now we have people like the British born Phil Craig who are pushing for the separation of the Western Cape from the rest of South Africa meaning that this British born man who claims he is South African by choice and that he chose to be South African, he wants the Western Cape to be separated from the rest of South Africa because he claims that South Africa is corrupt and oppressive. Now, the segregation of Cape Town is being pushed by people with old apartheid money. It's been pushed by people who are apartheid premiers meaning entrepreneurs who made their wealth and power during the apartheid regime. Some people who are behind this, who are actually pushing and advocating for this are people like Rob Hazoff, who is a businessman and one of the country's wealthiest men. Let's take a look. That if in 2024, the ANC remain completely in power on their own or in partnership with EFF, we need to get behind Cape Exit all our resources possible, and get Gate McKenzie, the PA, to buy into it. Gaten might be the first president of the new free republic in the Western Ken. Why not? Um, but I think we need to be, you know, let's focus on 2024 from the same country from the ANC. And if we fail, Let's get behind Cape Exit as urgently as possible. The Western Cape, referred by some as the pinnacle of good governance, a beacon of political excellence in contrast to the other provinces. Now, I do think it's a bold claim, often used for arguments for separation, but let's dismantle this narrative, right? Starting with the reality that Cape Town is haunted by the spectre of crime. This burden, is, uh, this burden of violence is disproportionately borne by the residents of the Cape Flats, which is an area starkly separated from the opulent areas of the coastline. Transport infrastructure, or the lack of, is also another talking point. While affiliant areas enjoy the benefits of efficient public transport systems, the promises of better connectivity remains unfulfilled in areas like Mitchell's Plain and Kailicha. Moving on to the notion of the province's economic muscle, yes, current statistics may present a flattering image, but we must ask ourselves, is this prosperity an isolated phenomenon or is it tied to the economic ebbs and flows of the nation as a whole? 
well, history whispers a revealing tale. During apartheid, the Western Cape was the beneficiary of a disproportionate funding. Its infrastructure, its roads, schools and hospitals are classed other regions and not through the miraculous way works of current administration but by a legacy of unequal investment the democratic alliance tenature stretching from the early 2000s witnessed claims of credit for those infrastructural advantages a narrative now under stern scrutiny this out it's just a sea of rubbish man this dam is on the outskirts of Danoon Township. It's been in this kind of a condition for years. The government gives people these plastic bags to throw the trash in, but they never come to collect them. And basically it just, it overflows in the streets, it's in the roads, it's in people's houses, it's everywhere. So they don't, they don't really have anywhere else to put it. So they end up throwing it over here um, because the government just never comes and collects it. And you can see Table Mountains right over there. Isn't that crazy? Two worlds apart, eh? These issues paint a sharp portrait of separation and not merely in economics or governance, but in the lived experiences of Cape Town's people. And that begs the question, is the campaign for separation grounded solely in administration performance and self-reliance or are these unspoken motives at play? which could be covered by governance and false promises of a better future. Now, looking at the Voices campaign for the segregation, the likes of billionaire Rob Hazoff and a movement such as Afri Forum, we notice a certain distaste at the demographic changes, the influx of hopeful souls from the Eastern Cape, among others. Now, should this separation succeed, what fate allow, awaits these recent addition to the Western Cape's tapestry? And let's not ignore the tapestry's most painful stains, which is the legacy of slavery. From the first enslaved people brought to Cape in the 17th century to the untold tales of the continued slavery post-1834 emancipation, and these narratives are essential for grasping the full spectrum of South Africa's complex relationship with racism and colonialism. In Western Cape, a slave labor laid the groundwork for colonial expansion, forming foundation upon which racial ideologies and systematic segregation were later built. Now, recognizing this allows us to understand the ongoing struggle against the racism within South African context. And as for those powerful individuals with segregation ambitions, they should be reminded that the past is never just the past and that it lives on echoed in the inequality we see today and potentially magnified in the pursuits of tomorrow. One cannot plug Western Cape from South Africa without tearing the shared tapestry of history, struggles, and survival. Now, the saga of the Western Cape's segregation debate is far from being black and white issue of good governance or autonomy. It's intertwined with threads of historical inequalities and continues to be colored by the shades of the not-so-distant apartheid shadow. Let's engage in the comment section. We want to hear your thoughts. What do you think about this whole situation? And while you're at it, please do give this video a thumbs up. Thanks so much for watching. Till we meet again, it is goodbye for now.